Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the Mars 2020 mission with John McGill. John is a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador and a NASA credentialed launch photographer. When he can slip away from his job as editor of this Astronomy for Everyone program. Welcome, John. Hi, Don. Glad I could make it back again and uh, talk about this very exciting mission. So, where would you like to start? Oh, we could probably start right off at Mars. So, all right, one of the wanderers. Yeah, that's uh, the ancient astronomers. They discovered that the stars didn't all stay exactly aligned, and uh, a few of them drifted off, and those were considered wanderers. And Mars was one of the easy ones to spot because that also had a red hue to it. This is how Mars looks through a telescope today. You know, basically a pretty good backyard telescope will give you that image. And there we can see what it looks like through the Hubble telescope, quite a big bit of difference. Well, that's for sure. In our next image here, this, if you look up at the upper uh, left-hand corner, that's actually an avalanche on Mars, and that's by one of the polar caps during the summer season. And this was taken by what's called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO. So this gives you quite a bit more detail, so you can see how we've progressed with what we do uh, see of the surface of Mars. Yeah, first class front row seat for sure. So, okay, now we're in orbit around Mars. Uh, have we ever landed on Mars before? Well, yeah, Don. Uh, actually, we have, but uh, the first ones to land on Mars was the Soviets, and they did that in 1971. But uh, their spaceship only lasted on the surface, uh, sending back data for 104 seconds. So we only got a partial image back uh, from that mission. But then... Um, we had a successful landing of Viking 1 and 2, and that was back in July of 1976. And it operated for 2,245 sols, or Martian days. That's what a sol is. Now, isn't a sol slightly longer than an Earth day? It is. It's approximately 39 minutes and 35 seconds longer. So a Martian year is approximately 668 souls, equivalent to approximately 687 Earth days, or 1.88 Earth years. So Viking 1 lasted approximately 3.4 Martian years, or 6.3 Earth years. Oh, that's a pretty good track record. If I remember, though, didn't NASA use a variety of uh, different landing techniques? Uh, yes, I did. Um, the first one, uh, that was the regular lander where, you know, they used the propulsion to get down to the surface. And I think that was Sojourner. That was one of the first rovers. And I think you might remember those. Oh, yeah, the big bouncing uh, balloons there. I think that thing bounced, what, like 30 times or something? Yeah, it did. This was what came out of those bouncing balls. And actually that set up like a heliport almost. And what happened was uh, the rover had to drive off of the top of that. So that created the problems of the rover, that being top heavy, to land in the correct orientation so it could drive off and not upside down. So that's pretty much why we scrapped the bouncing balls. Yeah, that and, seemed uh, a little dicey, yeah. And then we, we have some more coming down with the jetpacks or, you know, the thrusters. And here we can see a stationary mission. And this one was actually digging up samples. Okay, if, if you look at that, you can see that this had the solar arrays on the side to get power. And now um, this shows Curiosity with the sky crane and that's dropping curiosity and this is how we do it today with a perseverance rover i was just going to say is uh, is this how 
we landed perseverance. Uh, yes, it is. So I've heard different terms um, about this uh, program, Mars 2020, perseverance and ingenuity. Can you explain those uh, various terms for us? Yeah, sure. Mars 2020 is the actual mission. Perseverance, that's rover that's on the surface of Mars right now. Ingenuity is the helicopter. And uh, here's another picture. This shows you ingenuity underneath the belly there. That's, oh, yeah. Uh, kind of looks like a car or something on the belly pan. Uh -huh. And here's a picture of Perseverance dropping ingenuity onto the surface of Mars. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, John, can you tell us a little more of how we got to this point in our space mission to Mars? Yeah, well, basically, humans have been sending probes and robots to and near Mars since the early 60s, and dozens have successfully captured images, data about the planet, and gradually revealing its desert mysteries. We've learned a bit about its geology and atmosphere, found ice, and uncovered compelling evidence that Mars was once home to blue oceans. Now with perseverance, we'll search for evidence of past life on Mars, gather a broader picture of the planet's weather systems, prepare soil samples to be picked up by a future mission, and even attempt the first flight on Mars with a small helicopter named Ingenuity. Now here's the kicker. Perseverance will be conducting experiments that not only look for ancient life, it will conduct tests that will help pave the way for future life on Mars. Perseverance is built on the very successful Curiosity platform. So with, with that, I mean, it, it's like Curiosity 2.0 because they made some significant changes along is the way. Is Curiosity there. still active on Mars? Yes, it is. Here you can see some of the old missions and you can see Curiosity there, it's kind of, if you look at Perseverance, and then it's about uh, at the four o'clock position, you can see Curiosity. And that was a picture of Curiosity. And here's uh, the track that, or where Curiosity is today. And some of the upgrades, this next picture here, you can see that front tire or wheel Look to the back, you can see a hole in the tread, and you can see how the tread's falling apart right up at the top also. And so they had to upgrade the wheels. But if you look towards the bottom, you can see some square notches. And those were actually uh, JPL's little hidden message. And that's Morris code. And there's three lines on that, and it said JPL on those. And we'll talk a little bit more about hidden messages later. Some of the spinoffs, if you look at that tire on the left, that's an actual tire that was developed from the Curiosity rover. And that's going to be an airless tire that GM plans on putting on their 2024 cars that's going to be made by Michelin. They announced this in 2017, so we'll see if that still is, uh, you know, in the plans. That'll and sure one, help us on our Michigan roads, it, it seems. <laughs> yeah, it would, yeah, yeah. as long as they hold together and not be like the curiosities. The other tire on the right, that's a dune buggy tire, and that's a spinoff from Earth to Mars. And that's because the old tread pattern um, was easier to get stuck. And so they came up with uh, trying out the, what they call a paddle tire. And like I said, those are what uh, dune buggies use, especially out by Lake Michigan. You know, oh, yeah. The sand dunes yeah. that we have out there on the west side. Interesting uh, tire development there. And uh, some of the upgrades, we have the Super Cam, which has a lot better cameras and the Mast Cam. That's going to take pictures, and it's got two of them. That's kind of like eyeballs, and that's going to help with traversing the planet. And then there in the middle, you see Meta, and that's a weather station. And that weather station, they're actually going to use some pieces of spacesuit 
that's going to be wrapped around and they're going to test the material for the spacesuits for humans for later. And, Interesting. Uh, the turret or arm there, that's been upgraded because now it's uh, carrying a 110 pound drill bit on the end. Well, John, I, I think this would be a good time for, uh, for us to take a break. Uh, you know, before we get into the details of this interesting mission. If you have any questions, please send us an email uh, to the address that's down there at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next is Term of the Month with Stephen. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is Astrobiology. Astrobiology studies whether extraterrestrial life exists and how it may be de detected. Astrobiology makes use of molecular biology, biophysics, biochemistry, chemistry, astronomy, physical cosmology, exoplanetology, and geology to investigate the possibility of life on other worlds and to help recognize biospheres that may be different from that on Earth. The origin and er early evolution of life is an inseparable part of the discipline of astrobiology. While speculation may be entertained to give context, we know quite a bit about Mars, having studied it from Earth and having sent robots to orbit or to the ground. On Earth, biology requires liquid water. This requires a temperature and pressure range. In our solar system, Earth, Mars, Ceres, three moons of Jupiter, at least two moons of Saturn, a moon of Neptune, and possibly Pluto may all have liquid water somewhere. Life may exist, or may have existed at some time on these bodies. Since 1995, thousands of planets orbiting stars other than our own have been discovered. Some are thought to be at the right distance from their stars to have liquid surface water. Planets are common. Biochemistry may have begun as early as 10 to 17 million years after the universe formed. So there could be quite a bit of life out there. And that is Term of the month, astrobiology. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. Welcome back. We're here with, uh, with John McGill, a member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, and we're dissecting the Mars Perseverance Program. So John, I understand that you covered the launch of uh, Perseverance in person from the Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, I did. And uh, what you have to remember was that this happened in the middle of the COVID um, pandemic back in July or the summer of 2020. So things were pretty locked up at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And yeah, basically everything was shut down and only a skeleton crew was working at the base. Everyone else was working from home. There were times when people doubted whether the launch would even take place in 2020 or if we would have to wait until the next launch window in 2022. Now, it's, it's, it's my understanding that uh, a launch window is when Mars and Earth are lined up for the spacecraft to make their journey traveling the shortest distance and the quickest route, right? Yes, that's correct. And that happens about every two years. So as you can see in some of these pictures here, it's showing where um, I'm at the launch pad and that was about, oh, maybe uh, 50 yards from the rocket. And you can see we're wearing the masks. And here you got the other where um, there's nobody around by the media center. And then even at the time clock, that's where we had the press briefings instead of in the auditorium they were taken out and they called them uh, the time clock uh, press briefings okay so now uh, I, uh, part that i like to show and th these are my launch pictures i can never get enough of showing my launch pictures and showing them soft so remember uh, you've seen that picture of me setting setting up at the launch pad well this this is the picture uh, that was the result. And the next picture here, 
there there it is taking off so you can see it just first igniting and you can see all the smoke coming out to the right and these solid rocket boosters these things are really uh dirty and there it's going up and we're still going up and there you can see the trajectory how it uh, follows the curvature of the earth and there um there's where the solid rocket boosters are separating from the rocket and that picture is about 100 uh, miles downrange. And so we get to the next slide. In this next slide, this shows you the trajectory that the rocket actually takes. And this, uh, they, if you look closely, you'll see TCM one, two, three, on up to six. These are called trajectory correction maneuvers. And the first one's always planned because they don't plan on hitting Mars with the first uh, launch um, parameter, they have to correct it to get on course. And the reason they do that is because once the upper stage is separated from um, the actual spacecraft, then uh, the spacecraft makes its correction maneuver to actually head for Mars. In uh, the TCM two, three, and four, those uh, weren't needed. And even though this flight was delayed um, a couple weeks and they had to put in a new course, they were still so accurate that uh, they didn't need those middle three course corrections. And uh, the last course correction was happened just a couple days before they got to the um, planet. And so we were going 300, bil or 300 million miles and uh, we only needed uh, two course corrections right at the end. And this, this slide shows Jezero Crater. That's where we headed to. And Jezero Crater, they uh, believe that that was an ancient lake back about three and a half billion years ago. And the reason why we think it was a lake was because there was an inflow that's actually carved through uh, the Martian surface and it's left after uh, the water's all been gone now. And we see um, the inflow and then there's a delta and then there's an outflow. That outflow, if you look uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, that's the outflow. And if you think of Lake St. Clair here in our area, you have the inflow, which is the St. Clair River in we have the delta, which would be um, the Harsons Island and the St. Clair Flats, as they're called. And the outflow would be into the Detroit River. So here's where Jezero Crater is, and this was the landing site. And like I said, 300 million miles, and this landing was so accurate that we actually got within five meters of the planned target area. So this, this was really highly accurate. This um, showing EDL or entry, descent, and landing. And that's what they call the seven minutes of terror because it takes seven minutes once the spacecraft enters the Martian atmosphere till it gets on the uh, surface of Mars. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilo nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers above the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up 
on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. And remember when I was telling you about the hidden messages? Yes, well, yes, was, I recall. Yeah, well, here's uh, the hidden message that JPL put on this uh, rocket or this mission. And this one was on the parachute. And these words aren't actually on the parachute. What it is, it's a binary code, the colors and the separation. And what that uh, says is dear mighty things. And that means uh, the dear mighty things is the motto to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in La Cañada, Flint Ridge, California, the center of the robotics exploration of the solar system. Um, at JPL. The phrase comes from a frame, famous speech by Teddy Roosevelt when he was just governor of New York uh, before he became president, in, in which he argued that strenuous effort and overcoming hardship were what Americans must, must embrace. And here's the actual words. Thrice happy is a nation that has a glorious history. Far better is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Those are some pretty inspiring words. I would say yes. And uh, back to our images here in this one remember we talked about uh, the mars reconnaissance reconnaissance orbiter or mro and that actually took some pictures uh, while um, perseverance was going to the ground so here you can see that actual parachute and underneath it is uh, the sky crane with perseverance and this next slide shows um, more detail of the Perseverance rover on the surface, and it shows some of the parts um, that were deployed during the descent and landing. So you can see the heat shield on the right-hand side, and then over to the middle left is the descent, and then the parachutes and back shell. In this next slide, this one shows you um, the route that uh, the Mars 2020 rover is going to take to pick up samples and then uh, stash them. And you can see three distinct uh, areas or landmark features. So you have the bottom of the basin and that's the delta area. Then further up and to the right and top, you have some that's inside the crater. Um, but up high in elevation. And then that last area, that one's outside of the crater. So they're gonna be taking 
different type of samples and dropping them in different areas just to make sure that they can uh, have more than one area that's uh, left samples in. And uh, no, that wraps it up, Don. All right, well, you know, this has been a really interesting look at our most recent foray uh, down to the red planet. John, I wanna thank you very much for bringing this information to our viewers. And uh, I'm gonna ask our viewers uh, to please check out our club website. Uh, the address to the uh, website is down at the bottom of your screen as always. And uh, coming up to finish up the show is What's Up in the Night Sky with Stephen. Thanks, Don. What's Up in the Night Sky for March 2021? Remember, the 14th is the day that you turn your clocks forward, spring forward for daylight saving, at least in the US. Uh, it's also pie day, so have some pie. Now, February ended with a nearly full moon, so the last quarter is on the 5th, the new moon is on the 13th, the first quarter is on the 21st, and there's a full moon on the 28th. Now that's only a day and a half from lunar perigee, so this is a bigger than usual full moon. It's not going to be real noticeable, you'd have to measure it carefully, but it is there. Now, on, uh, shown here on the 6th, we have Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto about a half an hour or so before sunrise. Uh, Mercury is in Capricornus and moves to Aquarius over the month. Now here on the 6th, we have maximum western elongation for Mercury, so it's farthest apparent from the Sun. But we also have um, aphelion, where Mercury is farthest physically from the Sun, uh, on the 13th. That's not that far away, only a week away. Uh, also on the 6th, Mercury is only one degree away from Jupiter in the sky. Now on the 5th, it's even closer. Jupiter is in Capricornus, Saturn is in Capricornus, Pluto is in Sagittarius. Then shown on the 1st, uh, in the evening, uh, 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 like a 9 p.m.-ish, uh, really it doesn't matter that much, we have Mars in Taurus, and we have Uranus in Aries. You'll need, uh, probably you'll need small binoculars for uh, Uranus and a decent sky, uh, finder chart. Not visible in the night sky is Venus, which has superior conjunction on the 26th. So it'll be behind the sun, you won't be able to see it at all. It'll be in the glare of the sun all, uh, all month, uh, all, all of next month too. Neptune is in Aquarius. Neptune uh, has superior conjunction on the 10th, so it will not be visible uh, being behind the sun. And that's what's up in the night sky for March 2021. Now we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain.